Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sustainability and the Future of Luxury Retail with Marie-Claire Deveu, Deborah Weinswig, and Mer Mary Driscoll. We'll now turn it over to Deborah Weinswig, CEO and founder of Coresight Research. Thanks, Drew. Good morning and welcome to the Future of Sustainability and Luxury. I'm your co-host, Deborah Weinswig, CEO and founder of Coresight Research, and I'm joined by my co-host, Marie Driscoll, Managing Director of Luxury at Coresight. I'm also joined today by Marie Claire, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer and Head of International Affairs for Caring. Today, we are going to discuss the future of sustainability, the new normal in luxury retail, and the importance of diversity and inclusion. Coresight has hosted over 50 digital events since March 1st. Coresight researches the topics of tomorrow with impact for today, and we have been advising our retail, technology, and real estate clients in this unique environment. This Future Of platform is one to provide insights to the industry from thought leaders like Marie Claire. We are honored to introduce Marie Claire who has a deep background in all things retail and consumer. She is the Chief Sustainability Officer, otherwise known as the CSO at Caring, the, globally the global luxury group that manages Gucci, Saint Laurent, Bottega Veneta, Balenciaga, Brioni, and many more. Really the stuff that dreams are made of. In addition to fashion and luxury leather goods, Caring is also home to many notable fine jewelry houses. Marie Claire has had a stellar career in sustainability, beginning in government service in the cabinet of the prime minister, moving to the office of minister of ecology and sustainability, and then to the business world at a drug company, Sanofi Aventis Group. At Caring, Marie Claire sets the sustainability strategy, a tall order, and objectives and implements best practices within the group and the brand houses Maison. She has been pivotal along with Caring CEO, Francois-Henri Panon, and raising awareness on the global bar of sustainability. We couldn't have a more perfect guest join us today to discuss fashion and sustainable luxury. For those in the audience, thanks for joining us and please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask a question during the call. And if you'd like an opportunity to watch this webinar again, please visit Coreside Events for a video and transcript. So let's kick things off. First of all, Marie Claire, thank you so much for joining us today. So, hi everyone, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Thank you. So, I think let's just kick things off with the basics. How do you define sustainable luxury? So, sustainable luxury, for me, sustainability and luxury uh, goes on its own because when we are speaking about sustainable luxury, it's about how you pay attention to have the best savoir-faire, the best heritage, and also the fact that you pay attention to people and to the planet from the raw materials until the end of life of your products. So it's a huge topic. <laughs> So Marie, uh, Marie Claire, sorry, Marie here. Um, in, you set your vision 2025 three years ago in 2017. Your goal was to reduce your ecological footprint by about 40%. Tell us how you're um, tracking that, how you're measuring it, because um, like, and, and what categories did you start in? Was it leather, gold? Alors, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we decided to have a new step in our approach and in our journey for sustainability in 2017, and we define our strategy for 2025. But uh, it was not the starting point of our sustainability journey because many years ago, François-Henri Pinault decided to put sustainability at the heart of our strategy Mm -hmm. convinced by the fact that sustainability is good for business, but uh, it's also very important for ethics reasons. And to uh, answer your point, we have decided to have very clear targets with a specific calendar. So the 40% for the environmental uh, footprint, but also to reduce by uh, 50% our greenhouse gas emission, or to have, for example, the full traceability uh, for our raw mm -hmm. materials. And uh, thanks to a specific tool we created now a uh, few years ago, our environmental profit and loss account, we are able to measure our environmental footprint every year. And we didn't start by laser or by uh, cashmere or by wool. Uh, depending on the raw material used by the brand, 
we work for all uh, on all the raw materials. So it's also take the example between Gucci and Boucheron. If they want to achieve uh, the 40% of reduction, Gucci will work on leather and Boucheron will work on gold. So it's really depending uh, on the brands. And so that's why also link with our strategy, we define an action plan for every brand to be sure that we will be able to reach our targets. Marie Claire, having the action plan is obviously incredibly important so that what you're saying that you're going to do is what you do at the time that you're going to do it. Along those lines, can you talk about the, the EPNL results for 2019? Are you happy with those? And if not, where can you, do you think there's the most room for improvement? So I don't know if uh, our audience today is uh, familiar with the APNL. So perhaps in two words, uh, it's a tool that we put in place a few years ago, really to measure our environmental footprint, not only in our own operations, but also in entire supply chain until tier four. So it means cattle farming, cotton farming. And what is very interesting with the APNL, we give a monetary value uh, to our environmental footprint. And it's true that every year we publish our results because we think that transparency is key when you are on uh, sustainability and of course on the environmental side. So for example, a good thing with our last uh, EPNL results, we were able to reduce by 14% uh, one four by intensity between 2018 and 2019. And we were also able to reduce by 29%, so 29% uh, since uh, 2015. So you see, uh, I would like to say that we are on track, but we have to remain uh, quite nimble because to be able to reach our final target, the 40% mentioned by Mary previously, you can understand that we have to continue to push a lot the topic and we have a lot of work uh, to do. And only perhaps one thing, uh, if we want really to uh, reach our targets, we need also to find uh, disruptive innovations to support us to implement uh, concrete action linked with the raw materials or linked with the processes. So Marie Claire, one of the things that you really um, did as part of caring was to elevate the topic of sustainability um, in the luxury and in the consumer's mindset, insofar as you've open sourced um, what you've done so that other, um, other retailers and brands can participate and also evolve in more sustainable practices. Can you talk about how important it is like you may be a leader, but it, Karen can't do this alone. Hello, it's really linked with uh, the philosophy. Uh, we don't have so much time really to, to go into detail. But when I was saying that Francois Henri is convinced by sustainability, from the starting point, it's also convinced that if we want to change the paradigm and to tackle the most important issue of our century, climate change, loss of biodiversity, resource scarcity, even if caring is a big group with a big size, we are not uh, able to change the paradigm alone. So that's why the collective approach is quite key. And so that's why not only for the EPNL, but for all the best practices we have in the group, we open source to be sure also that uh, other group competitors can really implement. And perhaps also based on this philosophy, that's why last year, uh, the, the President Macron gave a specific mission to François Ripineau to create a coalition uh, in our industry to be sure that uh, with a collective approach and not only with a luxury company, uh, we will be able really to change uh, on the ground. And uh, with the fashion pack, you know now we have over 250 brands it represents 35% by volume. So it's a kind also of tipping point where you can change uh, concretely and operationally uh, the things on the ground. Well, thank you, Karen, for taking the lead. Yeah, no, it's really impressive. And, and Marie-Claire, you talked about this idea of um, kind of the, the convincing of Francois-Henri 
uh, back in 2015, what was the, you know, kind of, because some companies are still needing to be convinced. So what was the tipping point that really caused Caring to, to put this at the, if you will, the front of the line in terms of important uh, initiatives? Because again, I think uh, at the beginning, it was a personal uh, conviction uh, of François Ripino. Now for the companies uh, which are not convinced, I think what it's important is to listen uh, our clients, our consumer. Uh, above all, the Gen Z and the millennials, they are very, very sensitive about this topic and they are asking many, many questions. So it's one way uh, to convince people. The second way, and I think it's very quite interesting, it started two years, three years ago, uh, the financial community and also the financial analyst for listed companies, they are asking more and more questions also linked to sustainability. Even if they don't use the word sustainability, they will ask you questions about traceability, about animal welfare, about your impact on uh, ecosystem nature. And it's a way also to show that how much it's important. And last but not the least, it's also when you look at what is happening on the regulation point of view, the regulation is more and more demanding uh, all over the world. So that's why I think for me, for a company, uh, sustainability, and each time I, I speak sustainability for the social side and the environmental side, it's not at all an option, it's really a necessity. And when you are in luxury, because you set the trends, I think it's more a duty. So, you know, um, we think that sustainability is important across culture, across fashion. Um, as we entered 2020 this year at Coresight, we came out with a, a sustainability framework on Core. And then with the, ad, and, and we did this, Deborah, because um, we heard consumers asking for it. We heard customers, consumers, employees, and investors. To your point, and and you spoke about going on an investor show last, an investor um, show last year. So, but when COVID hit, it seemed like the the focus on sustainability got got pushed to the side. So, what happened internally at um, Caring and with COVID? Did anything happen? Have you renewed your efforts or? And, and what do you think has happened with, you know, the consumer in general regarding their focus on sustainability? Alors, if we are making the link between uh, the current situation and the crisis of the COVID-19, uh, and again, right. uh, it's not finished, okay? And we don't know what will happen uh, in, the next, uh, in the next months. The first thing, uh, and if we can say in this way, a positive impact of this uh, huge crisis is the fact that now I think the crisis has raised uh, awareness about the link between uh, the risk of pandemia and epidemia if you destroy the biodiversity, if you destroy the nature. Mm -hmm. Because you have uh, quite a very important numbers of uh, articles uh, which are making the link between epidemia uh, and the destruction of nature, ecosystem, and uh, biodiversity. So it's one thing. Uh, after operationally for, uh, for us, um, I think uh, it encourages us uh, to go uh, quickly to implement uh, our targets and to reach uh, fast as possible uh, our uh, objective. So if we can anticipate the 2025 for some uh, target, for some objective, uh, it will be uh, something that we would like really to obtain and we like to put in place. After, uh, as uh, you know, when we are speaking about sustainability, biodiversity, uh, climate change, uh, it's, uh, it's a long journey. Uh, you can't change uh, everything uh, overnight, but I think what it's important with the crisis, people are making the link between uh, nature, climate change, and what does it mean for their health. So I think also, uh, I don't have yet any evidence or any survey, but I have the feeling that not only for luxury, not only for the textile industry, people will ask again more and more questions and they will expect from the group and from the brands to take their responsibility. 
So Marie Claire, I, th I think that there's something here that's incredibly important. Uh, sitting in many boardrooms at the end of 2019, you know, sustainability was in the top kind of 100 of things to do, but the idea was that there was a cost associated with it. And what we've seen kind of over the past five and a half months is that there's this idea that sustainability can drive profitability and we've started to see, I, both Marie and myself have seen a significant outreach in terms of interest in the topic, but in lines of driving not only the top line, but also the bottom line. <clears throat> what are you seeing in, in regards to that? Alors, I think, uh, and I have always the same answer, because when uh, we are speaking about sustainability, for many people, as you mentioned, uh, it's a cost. And for us, from the same point, so not linked with the crisis or not linked with 2019 or not linked with what happened uh, with the World Economic Forum where people were speaking a lot about sustainability, uh, at Caring that uh, we have been always convinced that sustainability is an investment. And sometimes it could help us to reduce costs. Take the example of energy. If you reduce your consumption of energy or if you reduce your consumption of water, at the end of the day, you can earn some money. But of course, what you have to accept is the fact that sometimes for some project like a renewable energy or uh, other sink, you have to admit that the payback won't be a traditional payback. So in comparison to have a payback in the next two years or three years, you have to wait five years. But at the end of the day, it will be something that bring you some uh, huge benefits. And after I think that it, what is really changing a lot is the fact that people are understanding, again, there is no option. And for a company who want to continue to do uh, its own business for the next following years, if you don't put sustainability in your strategy, you will have uh, huge problems. So I think also the mindset uh, is changing. And of course, with the money you earn, for example, with the reduction of uh, water or energy, you can invest in research, uh, in innovation to find something else. So that's why for me, it's not a cost, it's an investment. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, looking at it from the other side. Well, um, just to finish off um, our questions, I know that animal welfare is especially important to you, biodiversity. Do you want to touch on that? Yes, uh, we put also in, uh, in our strategy in 2017, uh, the fact that animal welfare was a very important topic with the feeling that also because we were in luxury, we have this kind of uh, specific responsibility to move uh, the industry. And so that's why two years ago, uh, we wrote what we call our caring standards for animal welfare. Uh, and uh, we try really to do the rollout and to implement them. And same approach, we open source to be sure that all the company uh, can use them and can, and can try to implement. After biodiversity, uh, and I'm sure I am not the only one in the audience, you know that 2021 will be the year of biodiversity. So it's really important to take care of it. <coughs> Great, so I'll, I'll kick off. Thank you so much. I'll kick off. We have many questions from the audience. So uh, Marie and I will have to uh, be picky on what ones we choose, but why don't we kick it off with, which are the three most important drivers of sustainability in the end-to-end -end product customer journey? Uh, so uh, in the in the customer uh, in the customer uh, journey, perhaps the most important thing uh, it's about traceability. Okay, so really to know uh, where the raw materials uh, are coming from. Uh, we see also that uh, the question from uh, the customer are also of uh, uh, what the products are uh, becoming uh, after. Uh, the first use, so it's about uh, uh, how they can uh, resold uh, the product, how we can do uh, upcycling with, uh, with the product. Um, and perhaps also what is very uh, important, I think it's uh, to ask a question uh, in the boutique, because you know it's, always, uh, it's also a way uh, to uh, stimulate the, the conversation with, uh, with the brands. 
So we have a question here about um, your views on secondhand goods and the sustainability of that recycling. What, what's, what's your opinion or what's Karen's opinion? Alors, first, uh, I think on the sustainability uh, point of view, the first thing you have uh, to do, it's really to work uh, on your supply chain. So if you want really to reduce your impact, it's very key to focus on this. After, uh, of course, our luxury products are uh, long lasting, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, the second hand, it's also a good solution. At the level of carrying uh, all our brands, uh, they are thinking about this, but it's, the decision are really made at the level of uh, the brands. But of course, it's something very also interesting uh, to encourage uh, at the same time for environmental reasons, but also for uh, social reasons. But again, uh, it's not because you are doing the second hand that you don't have to work on uh, the way uh, of production. So processes and raw materials. This next question is one I have as well. So. Um, I'm interested in knowing um, Marie Claire's view of secondhand goods and are they sustainable? As I told you, I think in the, in the journey of sustainability, second hand goods uh, are interesting. Something also that is very interesting, but we are at the beginning, it's also to uh, work on uh, not only recycling, but upcycling. So with yeah. upcycling, uh, you can create uh, a second life uh, to uh, your product. So uh, you can do, uh, uh, I will say, uh, some things that a uh, furniture with uh, luxury goods. So it's very, uh, it's very interesting to think. You know, we have many solutions, but we are at the beginning. And what will be the challenge? It's really to put at scale all these kind of innovative solutions. So yes, for second hands, and uh, yes, for upcycling. So can you share with the audience what the best tools are for measuring um, changes in, in, in your own sustainable efforts? But I, I think uh, for us, uh, what we encourage, it's really on the environmental side uh, to use the EPNL, because I think if you want really to put in place uh, a strong uh, policy on the environmental side, you have to measure. Uh, it's like on the financial side. Uh, if you don't have KPI, you don't measure your financial results, you are not able to drive your business. So for the environmental side, it's the same thing. And after, for the social side, it's also to put in place uh, KPIs, target, and really to follow. So the main message is really you have to put in place uh, quantitative uh, KPIs. Like we are doing, uh, for the financial uh, side. And you know, in the governance approach in site caring, we have uh, the business review, but we have also sustainable review. So it's also to send the message that they are at the same, uh, at the same level. Right, and, and you, you spoke earlier before about how your environmental impact actually decreased last year. And, and yes. that was in tandem with like a double digit revenue increase. So, yeah, so that's why we are speaking uh, by, uh, by intensity and that's why also uh, at the beginning you have to put in place a lot of uh, efforts to be able to build, for example, for cashmere, for wool or for leather, a sustainable supply chain. But after when you have put in place this kind of supply chain, you can put at scale. So what is difficult, it's at the beginning to start. And after, it's really to do the rollout. I don't say that the rollout, it's easy, but uh, what is difficult, it's really to put in place because when you put in place a new uh, sustainable raw material supply chain, you have also to work with the local communities, with the NGOs, to be sure that the quality of your raw material is perfect so it could be uh, embedded uh, in your production and it will be, and our designer will be happy because... Uh, we have to work, of course, very closely with the designer and the design team. They are the boss. <laughs> exactly. Um, so along those lines, in terms of this, you know, kind of amazing platform and, and sharing insights across not only the group, but with others, have you seen other companies adopt the, the EPNL? Yes. Alors, so uh, 
uh, today all over the world, more than 150 uh, brands, so 150 uh, brands or a group have already uh, implemented an EPNL, okay? Uh, other brands or group are uh, putting in place, I will say, the organization uh, to use EPNL. After what uh, is sometimes making a difference, some companies are using an EPNL, but they don't disclose externally the results. So you have companies which are using it without disclosing their results. But uh, it, uh, people are interesting. After, so that's why we, we try really to push this tool because based on our experience, uh, we think that it's quite interesting. And what we did also for uh, students and uh, people who are in uh, design school or uh, fashion school, um, we put in place an app uh, called My EPNL, really to raise awareness and to show them how it's important to measure their environmental footprint and really to give uh, an order of magnitude between using a classical, a conventional cotton and an organic cotton. So it's also a way uh, to raise awareness from the beginning for our uh, new generation of designers or uh, people who will work in the fashion industry. Well, the, the really interesting thing there is, right, you know, retail can be incredibly competitive, but we have seen so many retailers come together around sustainability. And I think it's still very early, but it, it may translate into more coordination and collaboration going forward as well. F fully agree. And as we said, uh, collaboration, transparency are really key when you are in sustainability. What is also interesting when you are in the textile industry, it's not only to work with your own sector, but also to work with other sectors. I give you a concrete example. Laser, it's a byproduct. It's a co-product of the food industry. So if you want really to reduce your environmental in footprint, you at the level of the cattle farming, uh, you need to work closely with the food industry. So it's not only between uh, our sector, it's really also with uh, other uh, sectors. So, so we have a question about um, Caring's plans for smart textile waste recycling. Alors, what, we are, what, what I can share with you, uh, we have a, a quite uh, important number of uh, pilot uh, projects, okay? Not only, again, on uh, recycling, but also on upcycling. Uh, mm -hmm. You can understand that uh, yeah. I, I trust a lot on the upcycling because I think that, as I told you, it gives uh, a second life, not only to the product, but with the waste, uh, you can do the, the same thing. We have to be honest, uh, we are at the beginning. Uh, we are working closely with uh, some startups uh, and I'm quite confident. So uh, I don't know in the next two years, next three years, uh, we can have very uh, interesting project to implement uh, based on uh, laser waste, but also on, uh, on a fabric uh, waste. But uh, again, uh, it's at the beginning, and because we are in luxury, uh, we have always to pay attention to the highest standard of uh, the quality. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up with one last question, and uh, we'll close it out. But this one actually really speaks to me, and whoever asked it, thank you so much. Uh, so regarding tipping points, are there one or two major steps that if a huge majority of fashion manufacturers adopted, it could make a significant impact or drive widespread adoption of sustainable fashion. I'm wondering if there is a groundswell movement that consumers could drive. You, you know, I have, uh, well, if we, uh, if we answer the question with the point of view uh, of the consumer, mm -hmm. uh, I think the best way to push and to drive is to ask question about uh, which kind of raw materials uh, the traceability, uh, where the production has been made. Uh, if you are speaking uh, on the point of view of a company, is really to be aligned with what we call the science-based target uh, on climate change, uh, on biodiversity, again, really to uh, identify targets and objectives which are linked with the science. Because 
company, we are not uh, scientific uh, people. So to be sure that we are uh, aligned with uh, the Paris Agreement, or we are aligned also based on what the, the COP15 will decide uh, next year uh, on biodiversity, it's really important to have this kind of science-based target. But for me, you know, uh, customers, clients have a lot of power because if they are asking questions uh, inside the boutique, uh, if they are looking about what the social media uh, are seeing, if they challenge the brands, uh, I can tell you that they have a huge power. Beyond clients, you have citizens, so they have a lot of power. <laughs> Very, very well said. Well, Marie Claire, we want to thank you so much. Marie and I really enjoyed having this conversation. And we also just want to thank Caring in terms of just the, the lead that the company has taken on this incredibly important topic. Thank you so much. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs>